It's March 6th, 1930, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. For the first time anywhere, the most revolutionary idea in the history of food will be revealed in Springfield today. Not the voice of Lyle Lanley, the monorail salesman from The Simpsons there, (laughs) but in fact, a full-page advertisement printed today in history in 1930 in the Springfield Daily Republican, this being Springfield, Massachusetts, announcing the arrival of a test kitchen for bird's eye frosted foods. And the advert lingered on 26 products and listed 10 participating stores and gave their addresses. And it was illustrated with a a picture of a young woman shopper uh, in front of a store's new frozen food case. But below that was a caption that advertised, have a demonstrator tell you all about these amazing foods. I guess because at the time people would have been unwilling to believe that (laughs) these sorts of things could be tasty. And that was actually the issue that the inventor of fast freezing had run into. And that inventor was a man named Clarence Birdseye. <laughs> I had no I thought there was just a Captain Birdseye and that was it. Yeah. But there was a Mr. Birdseye at the heart of it all. He had developed this flash freezing technique of which more later, but the problem was is that it just wasn't catching on. His business they had founded in 1922, Birdseye Seafoods, went bankrupt just two years later in 1924 due to lack of interest. Frozen food was not new at the time. The problem was that it had a terrible reputation with consumers. Mm. Transportation companies were uneasy about actually transporting it because of the health and safety implications. And actually, relatively few retailers had freezers to store them in anyway. And if you did take it home and heat it up, it would be mushy and slushy. Mm. I mean, New York State banned frozen food from their prison system because they believed it was inhumane. That was the (laughs) reputation of frozen food food at this stage. It was seen as being for impoverished people. So the idea of selling it in a full colour advertisement was just complete anathema to anyone who'd ever engaged even remotely with frozen food until Bird's Eye came along. And if you want to imagine the sensation of what eating frozen food was like before flash freezing, if you imagine any time you've accidentally put something right at the back of your fridge shelf, right at the very coldest bit and the temperature's mm. been just a little bit too high, mm. and you bring forward your cucumber or something and it's just gone mm. mealy and mushy and gritty... That was what frozen food would have been like before this. Well, what's astonishing is how Clarence Birdseye got his inspiration for his own technique of flash freezing food, which came about because he was a naturalist at the US Botanical Survey, and he'd been working for the US government conducting a survey of fish and wildlife in Labrador in Canada between 1912 and 1915. And while he was up there, he uh, was working with the indigenous Inuit, and he noticed that they had this... Uh, almost immediate technique for freezing fish when they caught it and then later thawing it out. And he found that when they did it, the food was pretty much as delicious as, you know, eating it when it had just come out of the ocean. And what he said was, the first winter I saw natives catching fish in 50 below zero weather, which froze stiff as soon as they were taken out of the water. Months later, when they were thawed out, some of these fish were still alive. Now, I must say, (laughs) this thing made me go, really, you can't actually fly flash freeze a fish and then bring it back to life months later. But I actually did a bit of research around this and some footage emerged in 2008 of frozen fish being, inverted commas, brought back to life after being defrosted in warm water. And it was taken from this video in Japan where a man basically brings a fish back to life. It looks like he's bringing a, a fish back to life, but it was actually just living in a in a sort of state of suspended animation. This is horrifying information. This is really going to affect my Enjoyment of frozen fish. Yes, <laughs> I think once they've been cut into fish fingers, okay, they're definitely dead. Yeah. Well, Birdseye wasn't fine. wasn't in the business of practicing this. He was he was killing fish <laughs> and then freezing them. He was killing everything. Can we just like acknowledge that? Because <laughs> you true. talked about his job. What was his official job title? You said he went for the National Service of whatever yeah, it was. Biological I mean, survey. Right, that basically meant killing things. Like, all along, he was interested in killing animals. That was his two things, entrepreneurialism and killing stuff. So his first ever business, age 11, was he set up the so-called American School of Taxidermy, which was just him <laughs> posting out information on how to taxidermy animals from his parents' house via post. I love post. the idea that in old-timey times, he could just give himself that title. There was yeah. no other American School of Taxidermy. He was yeah. like, why not me, an 11-year-old well, boy? It probably was. But no, nothing to stop you advertising that you were there. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, essentially, in Labrador, 
Labrador. He was fur trading mm. whilst he was there. And he was killing stuff on behalf of US research. And whilst there, he liked to eat exotic foods on his travels. So mm. it maybe wasn't a surprise he stumbled across this method of fishing because he also ate, wait for this list, mice, chipmunks, porcupines, otters, rattlesnakes, skunk, and polar bear. Well, you know, they all tasted just as good defrosted as they would have fresh. <laughs> oh, you must try my polar bear for sticks. <laughs> that's, that's my Captain Bird's Eye. Yeah. I, we, we should say, if you're listening outside the US, you don't know what Captain Bird's Eye is, and I'm aware of that. Here in the UK... Captain Birdseye is apparently the longest serving brand personality since food advertising began. He was created in 1967 to sell Birdseye frozen foods and in 1991 was voted in a poll as the most recognised sea captain after Captain Cook. (laughs) I cannot believe Captain Cook outdid him, to be honest. I know, I know. I'm sure now the tables will have turned. Maybe it's because I think Captain Birdseye's gone on an unnerving journey from gnarled old sea captain to sexy sea captain. So maybe not everyone's familiar with the current incarnation. Yeah. So Clarence, or as he was known to his friends, Bob, went back home uh, from Labrador, Canada and thought, how can I recreate this flash freezing technique that I've seen the Inuit use? And he spent $7 yeah. on equipment. So that $7 bought him ice, salt and an electric fan, which seems like insufficient material to be able to <laughs> like perfect a technique, much of which is still being used to this day. But eventually yeah. he did hit on the right process, which basically was freeze the food down quickly as possible to minus 45 Celsius or minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit, then keep it thereafter at minus 12 degrees Celsius, minus 10 degrees f- Fahrenheit. I do not understand how Fahrenheit works. Um, <laughs> It's not obvious, so wrong. right? <laughs> um, and, and basically by doing that, then the cold would be infused into the food by placing the food into its own packaging and then pressing the packaging between two metal plates. And he mastered all of this stuff and quickly began to patent. And that was kind of part two of his genius. The first thing was recognising that there was this thing that could be done. And the second thing was to start patenting. Yeah, it was in 1927 he applied to patent his multi-plate freezing machine. It was quick, it was convenient, it was hygienic. The problem was that it was still just such a big sell for the public to accept. And what Mm. he really needed was a big name that had a reach and a budget that could win over reluctant consumers and retailers. So in 1929, he sold his company and his patents for a cool $22 million, which considering he hadn't really had any success, is a great, you know, that's a great payoff. But Post and Goldman Sachs, who bought the company, um, then established a new brand Brand, General Foods, mm. which gave a sense of the ambition because you had like General Motors, for example. They wanted to be that for industrialised foods. Mm. General Foods. But what's interesting is they kept the name Birdseye for the frozen food division. They mm. just realised that the name Birdseye, which was genuinely his name, yeah. was just kind of intriguing and compelling. And people wanted to say, that's an unusual name. Why is it called that? Oh, well, meet Bob Birdseye. He's a real person. <laughs> Because the other thing was that getting supermarkets to start having freezers was one thing, but consumers really needed freezers at home in order to take advantage of the potential of frozen food. I mean, even before electric fridges, most people had an ice box or at least a cool larder where you could keep fresh foods, you know, for a few days. Whereas there wasn't really a safe, low-tech alternative to a freezer. Mm. It wasn't until the 1930s that fridges started including freezer compartments. Although even then, relatively few people owned a fridge to start with. The stratospheric growth of fridge ownership in America... 8% of Americans owned a fridge in 1930. By 1944, 85% of Americans owned a fridge, and that fridge probably contained a freezer compartment. Mm. By the 1940s, Americans were eating over £800 million of fast frozen food a year. You have to bear in mind that these consumers weren't comparing the taste of frozen food with fresh food, they were comparing it with the stuff they'd just been through the war and had, which was canned or dried and salted. They were saying, here's convenient food that actually tastes like food. I'm still regularly shocked by how good frozen corn tastes. (laughs) Like, I should know this. You know, He's a simple man of simple (laughs) But like, in the age of readily available fresh food, you take it as a given that that's the way it's going to taste best. But sometimes when I'm cooking stuff for my kids and I, like 
cook some fresh frozen peas and corn. I'm like, actually, that is as good. The bird's eye products that Ollie Man still has in his freezer are potato waffles, absolute staple, don't go yes. to any other brand, <laughs> and the sweet corn. I, sweet corn in cans is a ripoff. Yeah, good one. Frozen spinach, revolutionary. Yeah, that's good too, for yeah. curries and stuff. Yeah, but you don't stick wanna... anything not on its own. Well, that in itself was what surprised me most about how they conducted this test on this day in 1930, that they led with spinach. Like one of their core <laughs> products right at the beginning was spinach. And I was like, that's not a food stuff that I would imagine would excite the imagination of you know, greater Springfield. 1930s Massachusetts but- dwellers. Hey guys, roll up, roll up. Taste spinach like you've never tasted before. <laughs> Tomorrow. Ooh, I can use that blueprint again. I'm a bit short of cash now. Let's just find another 16-year-old. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.